Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Assist us mercifully with your help, O Lord God of our salvation, that we may enter with joy upon the contemplation of those mighty acts, whereby you have given us life and immortality through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. A reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 12, beginning at the 12th verse. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. Just as the people who welcomed the Lord to Jeru Jesus to Jerusalem, let us praise our Savior Jesus and go forward to celebrate his Passover. Hosanna to the son of David, the King of Israel. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right to praise you, almighty God, for the acts of love by which you have redeemed us through your Lord, through your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. On this day, he entered the holy city of Jerusalem in triumph and was proclaimed as king of kings by those who spread their garments and branches of palm along the way. Let these branches be for us signs of his victory and grant that we who bear them in his name may ever hail him as our king and follow him in the way that leads to eternal life, who lives and reigns in glory with you and the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, in your tender love for the human race, you sent your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to take upon him our nature and to suffer death upon the cross, giving us the example of his great humility. 
mercifully grant that we may walk in the way of his suffering and also share in his resurrection through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The first reading is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 45, verses 21 to 25. Declare and present your case. Let them take counsel together. Who told this long ago? Who declared it of old? Was it not I, the Lord? There is no other God besides me, a righteous God and a saviour. There is no one besides me. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other. By myself I have sworn, from my mouth has gone forth in righteousness a word that shall not return. To me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Only in the Lord it shall be said of me our righteousness and strength. All who were incensed against him shall come to him and be ashamed. In the Lord all the offspring of Israel shall triumph and glory. Here ends the lesson.
The Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, You say so. Then the chief priests accused him of many things. Pilate asked him again, Have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further reply, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the festival he used to release a prisoner for them, anyone for whom they asked. Now a man called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection. So the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do for them according to his custom. Then he answered them, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that the chief priests had handed him over. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate spoke to them again. Then what do you wish me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him! So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him into the courtyard of the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters. And they called together the whole cohort, And they clothed him in a purple cloak, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him. And they began saluting him. Hail, King of the Jews! They struck his head with a reed, spat upon him, and knelt down in homage to him. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. They compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry his cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Then they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his clothes among them casting lots to decide what each should take. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two bandits, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, Aha! You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests, along with the scribes, were also mocking him among themselves and saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross now so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also taunted him. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, Listen, he's calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, 
Let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was God's son. There were also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, and Mary, the mother of James the Younger, and of Joseph and Salome. These used to follow him and provided for him when he was in Galilee. And there were many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem. When evening had come, and since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate wondered if he were already dead, and summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he had been dead for some time. When he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the body to Joseph. Then Joseph brought a linen cloth, and taking down the body, wrapped it in the linen cloth, and laid it in a tomb that had been hewn out of the rock. He then rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where the body was laid. have here a new calendar that I'm going to try to sell you. You will notice that it only has one day of the week. We have Sunday, followed by Sunday, followed by Sunday, followed by Sunday. Sunday only. No weekdays, no school days, no work days, just weekends. Weekdays. John Updick once wrote a book with this intriguing title. It was entitled, A Month of Sundays. That's where we get that phrase. It was about a wayward minister who was forced to spend a month of seven days in retreat and rest. So you don't like this calendar? Maybe I could sell you this one with Sundays and Saturdays, just full of weekends. Weekends, days off. We always look forward to the weekend, right? TGIF, thank goodness it's Friday because then we have the weekend. I remember when I lived in Los Angeles, there was a, a radio broadcaster and uh, when I was on the freeway, every Friday this guy, uh, the DJ would get on the radio and he would say, we have the weekend. And I wouldn't be in my car and I would think to myself, no, we don't, because I work on Sundays. Real life doesn't work like that. Real life has Sundays and Saturdays and weekdays. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And you see what happens in these other days, these other five days, this is where real life happens. A lot of real life. Real life happens on the weekends, but real life also happens during the week. We need to take each day as it comes. Bad days come with good days, and good days come with bad days. So as we remember this part of Jesus' life, it is a time when we enter this Palm Sunday into Holy Week. Now this Sunday is called Palm Sunday. And in some places, it's also called Passion Sunday. 
because we read the Passion on this particular Sunday. The introduction of the reading of the Passion is fairly new in the church, being introduced to Palm Sunday. The Passion was only read on Good Friday, but the problem was people didn't show up for Monday, Thursday, or Good Friday. And so the church felt the need to move the Passion to Palm Sunday, which is why we do the Passion on Palm Sunday and we do it again on Good Friday. Because next Sunday is Easter Sunday, when we remember the resurrection. So we go from Palm Sunday, this procession of joy into Jerusalem, to Easter Sunday, a Sunday of joy if we skip Holy Week. But you see, we're not supposed to skip Holy Week. We go triumphantly into Palm Sunday, we go triumphantly into Easter, but we remember that life is lived also in the in-between. So much happened between Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday. That is when we remember that Jesus died, that Jesus suffered for us on the cross on a day that we call Good Friday. Now, Good Friday is not a day that we like to talk about or think about because we don't really like to think about Jesus dying. Like anything unpleasant in life, we would rather just skip over it, not deal with it, put it behind us. But you know, life isn't like that. Life doesn't work that way. And one of the greatest things about Jesus is that he taught us how to live. And he taught us that the way he wants us to understand that we need to accept the bad along with the good, to accept the everyday along with the weekend. Time for leisure and fun, but time to go to work and have purpose. He came to show us that God is present on bad days too. That God is with us through the week, every single day of the week, not just on Sunday. I invite you this year to participate in the entirety of Holy Week not just Palm Sunday, Passion Sunday, or not just Easter Sunday, but attend with us Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, when we remember the bad along with the good. How else can we invite Jesus into our everyday, into our suffering, into our problems, unless we walk with him through his suffering and we understand that good and bad happens to everybody. I invite you to remember our Lord's Last Supper and Passion, as well as his triumphal entry into Jerusalem and to Easter and the Resurrection. I invite you to invite Jesus into your own good times and difficult times. Remember to invite Jesus to be present through all of it and have a blessed and holy, holy week. Amen.
Let us pray for all people and for the church throughout the world, trusting in the words and acts of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. O Lord, strengthen your whole church, especially the Hong Kong Sheng Kung Hui, that they may do the works of your Son. Guide your clergy and your people, especially Francisco Xavier, our Bishop. Unite in your truth and love all who confess your name, that we may live daily to proclaim your glory in all the world. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O God, give wisdom to all the peoples of the world and their leaders remembering especially this nation of Japan and all the countries whence we come, and guide all peoples in the way of righteousness and peace. Give them the heart to respect each other so that they may seek the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O God, we commend to your keeping ourselves and each other, our enemies, our colleagues, our families, our friends and neighbours, especially those who have birthdays or anniversaries this week. Give us grace, Lord God, that together we may know you and serve you and live in love for one another. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O God, have compassion on those who are in trouble, sorrow, sickness, need, or any other adversity. Remembering especially detainees and all other migrants in Japan, and any others we name in our hearts now. Give them your strength, build them up in courage and hope, and lead us all into the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O God, look upon all those who have departed this life. Fulfill your loving will for them. We praise your name, Lord God, for the blessing of faithful witnesses in each generation. And we pray that we, keeping fellowship with them, may be brought to share in the glory of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Gathering these prayers together, as well as those that we hold in the silence of our own hearts, we pray in the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Just a couple of announcements. Uh, we will be um, uh, celebrating Easter here at St. Albans. We'll be doing it in a very different way this year. Uh, but we will have flowers, so I invite you. Uh, you can't use an offering envelope. Some of you can. You come by the church. But otherwise, if you would uh, think to give online by going to our website and pressing the little green button uh, and make an offering for flowers, that would be much appreciated because we hope to decorate the cross in many people's memory. I don't have a memory of that, but I've seen photos of it, and uh, it looks pretty fabulous. So we'd like to do that again this year. I'd also invite you to come to Holy Week. And Holy Week uh, this year will be celebrated at 7 p.m. on Monday, Thursday, 7 p.m. on Good Friday, and 10.30 on Easter Sunday. 
go to the same, uh, however you registered for this service or logged into Facebook or the website or YouTube, you go to the same channel and you will find Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter. And I do invite you to walk with us all the way through Holy Week, as I talked about in the sermon. Um, don't have to get off work that early to run down here in order to participate in Holy Week. You can do it from home, from your phone. And I, if you've never done Holy Week, I do encourage you to do that as a very good discipline for Holy Week. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray you graciously to behold this, your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen.
this morning, uh, we are not actually meeting for worship together. We're doing virtual worship online. And the reason is because the bishop has asked us not to meet because of the COVID virus. Uh, and the government has asked for groups of more than 50 not to meet. So we are complying with both of those requests. And I want you to know that the church is still the church. And the church is actually the church still gathered. We're gathered in a very different way while we are socially isolating, but we are still a community of faith. This morning, uh, I will bless the palms, and the palms, uh, the palm crosses, will be at the front of the church. We will leave them there. I invite you, if you come to St. Albans for any time of private prayer during this Holy Week, to pick up one of the palm crosses. They are there at the entrance for you, each individually, as you come to pray this very holy week. Good morning and welcome to St. Albans. We are about to anticipate the coming of Jesus into Jerusalem as we celebrate this Palm Sunday. I don't know if you know this, but uh, before Palm Sunday, there's some preparations that go into preparing and making Palm Sunday happen for everybody in the congregation. One of the things that happens is somebody has to provide the palms because uh, it's not quite the same as when Jesus was in Jerusalem. When Jesus was in Jerusalem and the people see him coming, they grabbed what was close to them, the palm trees. They were able to cut down palms and put them in his way as a sort of a red carpet for him to come along and they would wave them. It was a procession. In modern day, we might think of it a little bit like a ticker tape parade. He took something that was common and made it very festive. So like paper flying down from the skyscrapers. But in Jerusalem, it was palms. Now sometimes we fold the palms into palm crosses because Palm Sunday is really an anticipation of the crucifixion. I'd like for you to notice something about this service. First of all, if you go to a funeral, at least in a physical church funeral, it starts off pretty much in silence. It's somber. It's serious. The beginning of the funeral starts that way. But as the funeral progresses, it gets more and more joyful. So that at the end of a funeral, we often sing, Jesus Christ is risen today. It moves from death and silence into the joy and celebration of the resurrection. This service is the opposite. We start with celebration, joy, palms, like a ticker tape parade, and we process around the church shouting Hosanna. Then we read the Passion, and it goes from Hosanna in the highest to crucify him, crucify him. It goes the opposite direction. It goes from joy and celebration to somber, serious lynching of a human being. This is our entry into Holy Week. We start with celebration and we are faced with the seriousness of what is about to happen to Jesus. It moves from celebration to somber seriousness. That is the point of Palm Sunday. Uh, this is the cross that we carry in procession on Sunday. And um, coming back to my image of the ticker tape parade, uh, if you've ever seen a parade, in front of the band, there's uh, the drum major. He's got a, it's called a mace, and he keeps time with that for the band. But he leads the parade. And the cross kind of does that for us on Sundays. The cross is in front of everything. It's the procession. It's the leader. And it tells us where to go. We just... It's easy, just follow the cross. So there's two images here. Um, one is, as we come in, we follow the cross. That's the point. We follow the cross. That's what we're doing in our Christian lives, is following Jesus on the cross. Another thing we do in Lent, we do this funny thing where we put this bag over the crucifix, and we put it over other images in the church. Um, sometimes it's purple, sometimes it's burlap. This one happens to be a combination of kind of like pur purple and burlap all together. Uh, we do that 
so that um, we're anticipating really the crucifixion. So we're not looking at the, cru the crucifixion yet in the season of Lent. And then just in the spirit of Palm Sunday, it's quite common to put a palm cross up there because it's just something else to make the procession more festive at that particular moment as we're coming in for Palm Sunday. And so this is the altar uh, at St. Albans and um, it is decorated in the way that it would be typically decorated for Palm Sunday. The frontal is red and the color of the day is red and it symbolizes blood is what it symbolizes. And we decorate it with a few simple palms. The lights remind us of the light of Christ. It's the reason we use candles in church, is to be reminded of the light of Christ. And the focus in our church and in our Eucharist is both the cross and the altar. Um, you might notice that when you sit in the pew, your focus is drawn to the altar. And that's because this is a place of holiness, the place where we are centered as a religious community. And even though we're not meeting Palm Sunday for communion, um, there is this theological uh, statement or position that even though you can't be present for the Eucharist, the desire to be able to receive communion is communion. That's provided for in our prayer book. And the most common example would be somebody who's sick in the hospital and for some reason cannot either eat or drink or is on a ventilator and cannot receive communion. So if the priest offers communion, just shows the host, if the person desires to receive communion, theologically we say they have received communion. Sort of, we have baptism of desire, we also have communion of desire. So even though we weren't able to gather today for communion, please feel as though we are in communion with one another and with Christ, our Savior. Amen.